Hi, welcome to the Hurricane Utah Adult Religion Class, sponsored by the Hurricane Utah North Stake of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I'm Mike Parker, and since 2008, it's been my privilege to be the instructor for this class. The Hurricane Utah Adult Religion Class meets on Thursday evenings between September and May to discuss the scriptures, teachings, and history of the restored Church of Jesus Christ. If you live in or are visiting the Hurricane St. George area, I'd love to have you join us. Time and location are available on the class website. There's a link to that in the show notes just below this video. Also on the class website, you can download my notes, which includes footnotes documenting my sources, this PowerPoint presentation, and handouts that I distribute in class. Please note that this YouTube channel and the class website are not official sites of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Hurricane Utah North Stake, or any other church unit or department. I alone am responsible for the content on these sites. What you're about to see is a recording of my notes for one of the lessons. If you enjoy this video, please click the like button and share it with a friend. And please feel free to subscribe if you'd like to be notified when new content is posted to this channel. My friends, the gospel of Jesus Christ is true. Joseph Smith was a prophet of God, and the authority and keys that he held are now vested in the First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve Apostles of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And most importantly, Jesus Christ is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. I hope you enjoy this lesson. In this lesson, we'll review Joseph Smith's family origins and childhood. We'll also examine his first vision and the events leading to it, as well as the early visitations of the angel Moroni and Joseph's reception of the gold plates that were the source of the Book of Mormon. This lesson will cover the narrative in Joseph Smith history up through around verse 53. Joseph Smith History is a brief selection from the Manuscript History of the Church, a project begun by Joseph Smith in April 1838. Joseph Smith History begins by discussing Joseph Smith's family background and childhood, and it continues up through May 1829, when Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery received the Aaronic Priesthood from John the Baptist, while translating the Book of Mormon at Harmony, Pennsylvania. On the 6th of April, 1830, the day the restored church was organized, the Lord commanded the prophet Joseph to keep a historical record. He made several attempts to write a formal church history before compiling the previous ones into the manuscript history. The excerpt of the manuscript history that we now call Joseph Smith history was initially printed in the first edition of The Pearl of Great Price, a missionary tract published in England in 1851 by Apostle Franklin D. Richards. Joseph Smith's history has been included in every edition of The Pearl of Great Price since that time, and it became part of our canon of scripture when The Pearl of Great Price was canonized in 1880. The narrative in Joseph Smith history was, however, only one of several accounts Joseph left of his first vision and other early experiences. In this lesson, we'll look at this and other accounts and see what information we can learn from them. Joseph Smith Jr. was a descendant of Robert Smith Jr., who sailed from England to America in 1638 at age 12 at the height of the Puritan emigration. Robert's descendants settled in Topsfield, Massachusetts, a farm village 10 miles or 16 kilometers north of Salem. Robert's great-grandson, Asel Smith, was the father of 11 children by Mary Duty, one of whom was Joseph Smith Sr. Asel Smith fought on the side of the colonies in the American Revolutionary War. Facing unfavorable economic conditions, in 1791, Asel sold the family farm in Topsfield and moved his family to Turnbridge, Vermont, where he had purchased 83 acres of uncleared land. 
In Topsfield, he became a moderately prosperous farmer and was able to give each of his seven sons their own land farm. Lucy Mack was the youngest of eight children born to Solomon Mack Sr. and Lydia Gates. Solomon was born in Connecticut and fought in both the French and Indian War and the Revolutionary War. Solomon's life is an epic story of repeated fortune and success, followed by total loss and destitution. He was severely injured several times. In 1761, Solomon Mack moved his family from Lyme, Connecticut to Marlow, New Hampshire. By 1773, the family had relocated to nearby Gilsom, where Lucy was born in 1776. During a visit to her brother's home in Turnbridge, Lucy Mack met Joseph Smith Sr. They were married in January 1796. Joseph Smith Sr. was a spiritual man, but not a terribly religious one. He firmly believed in prayer and was given to frequent prophetic dreams and spiritual impressions, but he hovered on the margins of the churches. Lucy Mack Smith, on the other hand, was greatly concerned about her spiritual state, and she taught her children from the Bible. She investigated many different denominations, including Methodism and Presbyterianism. Joseph Sr. and Lucy Mack Smith had 11 children, the first 10 of whom were born in Upper Vermont and New Hampshire. Two of their sons died at or shortly after childbirth. Joseph and Lucy started their married life with a reliable farm. After six years, they rented out their farm and opened a store in Randolph, Vermont. They suffered a fateful loss in 1802 when Joseph Sr. put a large amount of money into a ginseng shipment that was stolen by a business associate. He lost everything and was financially ruined. He was forced to sell off his farm to pay his debts, after which the Smiths crossed the boundary dividing independent ownership from tenancy and day labor. Over the next 14 years, from 1802 to 1816, the Smiths moved seven times, all within the upper Vermont, New Hampshire region. They labored as tenant farmers, renting land until it was sold out from under them or a better work opportunity arose elsewhere. Joseph Sr. taught school in the winter and the family made and sold household items. Despite their misfortune, they managed to eke out a reasonably comfortable living, but never a secure one. It was during this period of hardship that Joseph Smith Jr., their fifth child and third surviving son, was born on the 23rd of December, 1805 in Sharon, Vermont. When Joseph Jr. was six years old, he required surgery. In 1812 and 1813, there was an outbreak of typhoid fever in the region of New Hampshire where the Smiths lived. Several Smith family members fell ill and Joseph Jr. experienced a common complication where the typhoid bacteria infected the bone, in Joseph's case, his left shin bone. This type of infection normally required amputation, but Lucy refused to allow it. One of New England's most respected physicians, Dr. Nathan Smith, proposed an alternative surgical procedure that involved removing the dead portion of the bone. The surgery was performed without anesthetic or antiseptic. Joseph's father held him while the surgeons bored holes on each side of his shin and removed three large pieces of infected bone. Joseph survived and eventually recovered, though he was either in bed or on crutches for three years and walked with a slight limp for the remainder of his life. Medical bills and three successive years of crop failures forced the Smith family to leave Vermont in 1816. They migrated to Western New York. Creditors and dishonest traveling companions took what little this family still owned. When the Smiths arrived in Western New York, Lucy had only a few possessions and nine cents. The Smiths settled in the small town of Palmyra, 20 miles or 32 kilometers west southwest of Rochester. At that time, the construction of the Erie Canal was just getting underway. 
The family initially lived on the west end of Palmyra's Main Street. They sold refreshments from a cart, hired out for farm work, and took odd jobs like gardening and digging wells. By the summer of 1819, the Smiths had saved enough money to purchase a 100-acre farm 1.7 miles, or 2.7 kilometers, south of Palmyra in Manchester Township. There, they built a small log home and began to clear the land. They soon began work on a more comfortable frame home, which they occupied in the spring of 1825. The Smith family was devastated by the death of 25-year-old Alvin Smith, Joseph Sr. and Lucy's oldest son, in November 1823. In his 1838 history, Joseph Smith Jr. recalled an unusual excitement on the subject of religion in the area near his home, which he said began around late 1817 or early 1818. This revival movement began among the Methodists, but it soon spread to include the Baptist and Presbyterian denominations. What Joseph described in his account is called by historians the Second Great Awakening. During this period, which lasted from approximately 1800 to 1860, American church membership and church attendance soared. One area of particular commotion was Western New York, which was later called the Burned Over District. This name was inspired by the idea that the area had been so heavily evangelized as to have no fuel, unconverted people, left over to burn or convert. Palmyra and Manchester were a part of that area. Joseph recalled in 1838 that the revivals led to contention and bad feelings among the people who were evangelized to the various sects. Quote, For notwithstanding the great love which the converts to these different faiths expressed at the time of their conversion, and the great zeal manifested by the respective clergy, when the converts began to file off, some to one party and some to another, it was seen that the seemingly good feelings of both the priests and the converts were more pretended than real. For a scene of great confusion and bad feeling ensued, priest contending against priest and convert against convert, so that all their good feelings, one for another, if they ever had any, were entirely lost in a strife of words and a contest about opinions." Unquote. Joseph's mother and siblings were converted to the Presbyterian faith, and Joseph said that, quote, he wanted to get religion too, wanted to feel and shout like the rest, but he could feel nothing, Unquote. In his 1832 account of his first vision, he recalled that his concern for his own sins had caused him to study the Bible, hoping that it would help him find the truth. He wrote in his own hand, quote, At about the age of 12 years, my mind became seriously impressed with regard to the all-important concerns for the welfare of my immortal soul, which led me to searching the scriptures, believing, as I was taught, that they contained the word of God. And I felt to mourn for my own sins and for the sins of the world. Therefore, I cried unto the Lord for mercy, for there was none else to whom I could go and obtain mercy." Unquote. His study of the scriptures lasted two years. He eventually came to the now famous passage in the Epistle of James, chapter 1, verse 5, which gave him the direction he was seeking. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, that is to say, reprove or criticize, and it shall be given him. Joseph dictated in 1842, quote, Believing the word of God, I had confidence in the declaration of James. I retired to a secret place in a grove and began to call upon the Lord, unquote. Despite all his searching up to this point, 
Joseph confessed in his 1838 account that he had never as yet made the attempt to pray vocally. It would be more accurate to call the event that followed Joseph's first visitation. He didn't just see the father and the son in a vision. They came to him personally and stood in his presence. Joseph left four first-hand written accounts of his vision in 1832, 1835, 1838, and 1842. There are also five other detailed accounts of the first vision from witnesses who heard Joseph relate his experience and reported what he said during his lifetime, as well as numerous references made in passing by others during Joseph's lifetime and recollections made after his death by those who heard him speak. Of the accounts Joseph left, each was given at a different time, under different circumstances, and to a different audience, which explains the minor differences in the details between the accounts. By reading all of them, we obtain a richer, fuller picture of what happened in the grove that day. Joseph said that he was between 14 and 15 years of age when he had his first vision. He identified the approximate date and described the scene. Quote, it was on the morning of a beautiful, clear day early in the spring of 1820." Unquote. He retired to a secret place in a grove, but a short distance from his father's house. My father had a clearing, he testified to David White, and I went to the stump where I had stuck my ax when I had quit work, and I kneeled down and prayed, saying, O Lord, what church shall I join? Several things happened immediately as Joseph began to pray. He recalled that he was seized upon by some power which entirely overcame me. His tongue seemed to be swollen or bound. It cleaved to the roof of his mouth so that he was unable to speak. I heard a noise behind me, he dictated in 1835, like some person walking towards me. I sprung up on my feet and looked around, but saw no person or thing that was calculated to produce the noise of walking. He was tempted by the powers of darkness. The adversary filled his mind with doubts and brought to mind all manner of inappropriate images. Because of these, Joseph was ready to sink into despair and abandon myself to destruction, not to an imaginary ruin, but to the power of some actual being from the unseen world who had such a marvelous power as I had never before felt in any being. He persevered and prayed more fervently, and he was delivered from this dark power. Just at this moment of great alarm, Joseph said, I saw a pillar of light exactly over my head, above the brightness of the sun, which descended gradually until it fell upon me. In his earliest account, Joseph first wrote a pillar of fire he then immediately crossed out fire and wrote light. It may be that he struggled to find the right word to describe what he saw. In his next account, he also described what he saw as a pillar of fire. One second-hand account likewise referred to it as a fire towards heaven. Apostle Orson Pratt left this vivid description, quote, the light appeared to be gradually descending towards him, and as it drew nearer, it increased in brightness and magnitude, so that by the time it reached the tops of the trees, the whole wilderness for some distance around was illuminated in a most glorious and brilliant manner. He expected to have seen the leaves and boughs of the trees consumed as soon as the light came in contact with them, but perceiving that it did not produce that effect, he was encouraged with the hopes of being able to endure its presence." Unquote. These accounts were written in an age before electric lighting, when the brightest earthly object a person could conceive of was fire. This brilliant light was the glory of God's presence. We see similar descriptions in scriptural accounts written by prophets who saw God personally, Moses' burning bush, 
the fiery pillar that led the Israelites through the wilderness, and Lehi's first vision of a pillar of fire that dwelt on a rock before him, are all descriptions of the presence of God that invoke the imagery of fire. The glory of the Lord's presence will consume those who are wicked and purify those who are righteous. In Joseph's case, when the light rested upon him, he was filled with the Spirit of God and with joy unspeakable. Like Moses, the glory of God was upon him. Therefore, he could endure God's presence. This light filled Joseph with joy unspeakable. A personage appeared in the midst of this pillar of flame, and another personage soon appeared like unto the first. Their brightness and glory defy all description, Joseph recalled, and they stood above me in the air. One of them spake unto me, calling me by name, and said, pointing to the other, This is my beloved son. Hear him. In his earliest account of the first vision, Joseph simply wrote that, I saw the Lord, without indicating that a second personage also appeared to him. However, just because Joseph initially wrote that he saw the Lord doesn't mean he didn't also see a second personage as well. Two accounts state that the father and the son exactly resembled each other in features and likeness. A third says that they were also identical in stature. One account gave us this detailed description of God the Father, quote, light complexion, blue eyes, a piece of white cloth drawn over his shoulders, his right arm bare. In one account, Joseph indicated that he also saw many angels in this vision. The first thing the Lord told him was, quote, Joseph, my son, thy sins are forgiven thee." Unquote. Joseph's leading concern going into the grove was that he might find forgiveness for his sins. Joseph then asked the Lord which of all the sects was right and which he should join. Some people, both inside and outside of our faith, have interpreted the answer he received as being a harsh condemnation of other Christian denominations. A careful reading of what Joseph reported, however, demonstrates that the Lord's criticism was more narrowly focused than that. Quote, the personage who addressed me said that all their creeds were an abomination in his sight, and those professors were all corrupt, that they draw near to me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They teach for doctrines the commandments of men, having a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. Unquote. The churches Joseph had investigated were not abominable. Rather, it was their creeds that offended the Lord. A creed is a statement of belief. The word specifically refers to the creeds that were formulated by Christians in the centuries following the New Testament period. Formulations like the Nicene Creed, the Chalcedonian Creed, and the Athanasian Creed deviate from the revealed truths about the nature of God and are false. The term professor does not refer to a university instructor. Rather, it is, quote, one who makes open declaration of his sentiments or opinions, particularly one who makes a public avowal of his belief in the scriptures and his faith in Christ, and thus unites himself to the visible church, unquote. In other words, professors were religious people who professed the creeds, not just teachers and ministers. Note the Lord's specific reference to those professors. His criticism was leveled at the people Joseph had encountered at the revivals near his home. As Joseph recalled in 1832, quote, my intimate acquaintance with those of different denominations led me to marvel exceedingly, for I discovered that they did not adorn their profession by a holy walk and godly conversation agreeable to what I found contained in the Bible." Unquote. There are many sincere people who are searching for the truth. God does not condemn these individuals. Rather, he condemns those who are insincere 
and hypocritical in their Christian practice. Despite the sincerity of many of the world's Christians, however, the fact remains that on that spring morning when Joseph Smith entered the grove, there was no church on earth that had all of God's truth. In 1842, Joseph testified that the personages, quote, told me that all religious denominations were believing in incorrect doctrines, and that none of them was acknowledged of God as his church and kingdom, and I was expressly commanded to go not after them." Unquote. Joseph also received a promise that the fullness of the gospel should at some future time be made known unto me. And he wrote, many other things did he say unto me, which I cannot write at this time. As far as we know, Joseph never did commit those other things to paper. The visitation ended, leaving his mind in a state of calmness and peace indescribable. Joseph described himself lying on his back, completely drained of physical strength. It was some time before he was able to recover enough strength to walk home. Joseph described the aftermath of the visitation. Quote, my soul was filled with love, and for many days I could rejoice with great joy, and the Lord was with me, but I could find none that would believe the heavenly vision." Unquote. Joseph related his vision to a few individuals at the time, including a Methodist preacher, but he received only negative reactions and persecution. For the next three and a half years, Joseph received no additional heavenly communications. He said that during this time, I continued to pursue my common avocations in life. As I mentioned earlier, these included clearing land and working his father's farm, building the family's new frame home and crafting items for sale like barrels and maple syrup. Joseph and his brothers also hired themselves out to other farmers in the area. One other practice in which Joseph's family was involved was the then common pastime of treasure seeking. At that time, many people in Western New York believed that buried gold or forgotten silver mines had been left by Spaniards or pirates and were just waiting to be discovered. It was a popular and widespread practice to search for these lost treasures with the aid of supernatural objects like seer stones. Joseph Smith Jr. was sometimes called upon by neighbors and acquaintances to help find lost items or dig for treasure. He had a local reputation for being able to see hidden or missing objects. In his 1838 history, he described being hired by Josiah Stoll in October 1825 to dig for a Spanish silver mine in Harmony, Pennsylvania. Joseph probably mentioned this incident because Peter Bridgman, a nephew of Stoll's wife, had sworn out charges against Joseph in South Bainbridge, New York in 1826. Bridgman accused Joseph of being a disorderly person, which according to New York law, included people who pretended to have skill in discovering lost goods. At a hearing to determine the validity of the charges, several witnesses, including Josiah Stoll himself, who had hired Joseph, testified that Joseph did indeed have the ability to see hidden things. As the proceedings were simply an examination and not an actual trial, and Stowell himself did not bring any charges, Joseph was released and there was no verdict. In response to the question, was not Joe Smith a money digger? Joseph responded playfully, quote, yes, but it was never a very profitable job to him and he only got $14 a month for it, unquote. The evidence leads to the conclusion that Joseph Smith really did have a supernatural gift of seeing things that were hidden. This gift was something that the Lord was able to put to effective use, as we'll see in next week's lesson. Joseph also confessed that in the years after his first vision, quote, I fell into transgressions and sinned in many things which brought a wound upon my soul, unquote. He, quote, frequently fell into many foolish errors and displayed the weakness of youth and the foibles of human nature, unquote. Nothing truly serious, but behavior that was, quote, not consistent with the character which ought to be maintained by one who was called of God, 
unquote. He was praying for forgiveness for these sins and follies on the night of the 21st of September, 1823, when he received his second divine visitation. On that night, an angel of God appeared to Joseph in the upstairs bedroom of the Smith family log home. Just as he had experienced in his first vision, the appearance of the angel was preceded by, quote, a light like that of day, only a far purer and more glorious appearance, and brightness burst into the room. Indeed, the first sight was as though the house was filled with consuming fire, unquote. The angel identified himself as Moroni. He told Joseph that the Lord had forgiven his sins and that, quote, his name should be had for good and evil among all nations, kindreds, and tongues, unquote. He then prophesied of things that were shortly to come to pass. Joseph recalled that the angel, quote, said there was a book deposited written upon gold plates having an account of the former inhabitants of this continent and the source from whence they sprang. He also said that the fullness of the everlasting gospel was contained in it as delivered by the Savior to the ancient inhabitants." Unquote. Moroni appeared to Joseph three times that night and once the next day, each time repeating the same message with additional information and instructions. On Moroni's third visit, Joseph wrote, the angel, quote, added a caution to me, telling me that Satan would try to tempt me in consequence of the indigent circumstances of my father's family, to get the plates for the purpose of getting rich. This he forbid me, saying that I must have no other object in view in getting the plates, but to glorify God, and must not be influenced by any other motive but that of building his kingdom, otherwise I could not get them." Unquote. After Moroni's fourth visit the next day, Joseph, quote, went to the place where the messenger had told me the plates were deposited. Joseph described where the record was buried, quote, convenient to the village of Manchester stands a hill of considerable size and the most elevated of any in the neighborhood, unquote. This hill is two and a half miles, or four kilometers, south of the Smith family farm. The plates were concealed in a stone box on the west side of this hill, not far from the top. Joseph pried open the box with a lever and discovered within it the gold plates, along with two interpreters, or seer stones, which Joseph later called Urm and Thummin, with a breastplate. Joseph tried to remove the plates but he was prevented from doing so by the sudden appearance of Moroni. In 1832, he recalled, quote, I immediately went to the place and found where the plates were deposited as the angel of the Lord had commanded me and straightway made three attempts to get them. And then being exceedingly frightened, I supposed it had been a dream or vision, but when I considered, I knew that it was not. Therefore, I cried unto the Lord in the agony of my soul, why can I not obtain them? Behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto me again and said unto me, You have not kept the commandments of the Lord which I gave unto you. Therefore, you cannot now obtain them, for the time is not yet fulfilled. Therefore, thou wast left unto temptation, that thou mightest be made acquainted with the power of the adversary. Therefore, repent and call on the Lord, thou shalt be forgiven and in his own due time thou shalt obtain them. For now I had been tempted of the adversary, and sought the plates to obtain riches, and kept not the commandment that I should have an eye single to the glory of God." Unquote. Joseph's family was nearly always on the brink of abject poverty. He saw the plates and desired to have them because of their monetary value. He was chastened by Moroni, and told to come back every year on the same day until he was ready to receive them. Joseph was obedient to Moroni's instructions, and he obtained the plates four years later on the 22nd of September, 1827. That concludes this lesson. 
If you enjoyed it, please click the thumbs up button and leave a comment below. Please subscribe if you'd like to be notified when new lessons are posted to this channel and visit www.huarc.org to download these notes and this slideshow. In the next lesson, we'll discuss Joseph's translation of the Book of Mormon, when and how it was accomplished, and the scribes and other believers who assisted him in the effort. The reading is Doctrine and Covenants, sections 3, 5, 10, and 17. See you next week.